in this uh, session we will be uh, looking at uh, another uh, another group of algorithms associated with the classification of the data right we have already uh, looked at uh, nearest neighbors algorithm we have looked at naive bayes algorithm for doing the classification of the data we have also looked at the decision trees for classification of the data so one more important uh, group of formulas or group of uh, techniques for doing the classification is using the rules so we will be seeing how these rules are different from any of these majorly you will always uh, compare the rules with decision trees so where are they good at where are they not good at when i compare them with decision trees those are the various aspects that we would be looking at so what do we mean by a classification rule how is it different from decision trees what is the strategy the classification rules actually get into we have seen that the decision trees get into a strategy called divide and conquer whereas because they divide the data into uh, subgroups and based on the subgroups they try to match a particular uh, feature uh, and they try to map it to the predicted class whereas here it is purely separate and conquer there is no division right there is uh, no tree structure that is getting formed it is the data is separated based on one or more variables and based on that the mapping to the predicted class the mapping to the decision class is typically done so we'll try to understand how the separate and conquer algorithm works and how is it typically different from the divide and conquer of the decision trees so here we will look at two important algorithms of the same one being the one rule algorithm so there is only one single rule typically people call it as 1r or 1r like this so initially we will have something called 0r which is like where there are no rules at all i will uh, look at it as a base i will look at uh, what is the base classification accuracy that is no rules all of them i classify them into the maximum frequency class so if i am looking at uh, default versus no default and if i see 70% uh, of the people are no default 30% of the people are default any new data that i am getting i will classify them as no default only that is the zero r kind of an algorithm but when i am looking at one rule algorithm so i am uh, i am creating a rule based on one variable or one feature and i would like to see whether that one feature can segregate the data much more better compared to a zero rule algorithm so we will try to see the one rule algorithm and based on that we'll see what could be the limitation that this particular algorithm can carry so on the top of that an improvised version of the one rule algorithm is the ripper algorithm so we'll spend some time try to understand the ripper algorithm so these two are two important implementations of the rules based algorithm similarly there is a way that i can generate the rules from the decision trees itself so even my decision trees can generate the rules for me so if i am trying to generate the rules from the decision trees what are the advantages and what are the disadvantages associated with those rules and once we have a basic conceptual understanding of all these aspects we'll take up a data set and on that data set we'll try to execute this whole process so with that basis let's get started so if i have to understand the classification rules so the simple fundamental here is 
whatever is the knowledge that I am capturing from the data. So that whole knowledge is taken in the form of if-else statements. So if age is greater than 50, then the person will default. If age is less than or equal to 50, the person will not default. So some kind of simple or complex if-else statements are typically created and based on that, we are assigning a class default or no default to the unlabeled example. So instead of a tree structure, we create a set of rules. The rules are created in the form of if-else statement. So we have an antecedent and a consequence. The antecedent is if age is greater than 50. And the consequent is the class, which is the default. So it would be interpreted primarily like if this happens, then that happens. If age is greater than 50, then the person will default and so on. So in the antecedent, instead of one single feature, we will have a combination, right? We can have a combination of the features. So the more and more combinations of features I am using, the more complex will be my rule. But consequent is always the class. So default versus no default. So the class that I am trying to assign when this rules conditions are typically met. So this is the way my classification rules are generally created. So I will create some kind of a knowledge from the data. The knowledge is created in the form of rules. And those rules are generally used for future action. So generally, there are applications wise, I can use that for customer segmentation. I am looking at the characteristics of groups of people. And based on that characteristics, I will try to say this particular product will be purchased by this group or this particular product will not be purchased by this group. Right? So similarly, Whatever are the conditions, if I want to look at the stock prices increasing, decreasing, large drops, large increases, I want to see what are the conditions that precede the large drops or large increase in the stock prices. So all these kinds of things can very well be targeted using the classification rules. Now generally, the classification rules are compared with respect to the decision tree. Now, in a decision tree, as I have already highlighted, the rules typically come from top to bottom. Right? The segregation of the data is typically done like this. And here, the decision at the leaf node, I am actually making a decision of either default or no default kind of stuff. Whereas in case of rule, we don't have this kind of a tree structure. It is purely standalone. So there is no top to bottom kind of a process. That's where it is called separate and conquer rather than divide and conquer. So the result is more and more parsimonious, more and more trustworthy, more and more reliable, direct, easy to understand rather than are compared to a decision tree. So that is where some positive thing comes up with respect to the rules. In case of decision tree, because of this entire structure, there are some kind of biases that are being introduced. Whereas in case of rule learning, I can very well avoid that bias quite comfortably. Now, those are some of the positive sides of the rule-based algorithms compared to the decision tree approach. So, again, till now, whatever we have seen, when I look at the nearest neighbors kind of algorithm, they require most of the data to be numeric in nature. Even if it is non-numeric, I have to convert it into dummy variable. If I am talking about a naive bias algorithms, it expects that all the variables are to whatever extent they are categorical in nature. Even if they are not categorical, I have to convert them into categories. 
I have to convert them into categories so that the probabilities of each of the groups can very well be computed. Similarly, when I am talking about the decision trees, the system will, uh, even there, the variables should be to large extent numeric in nature. Right? If they are more categorical, the model becomes more and more complicated and difficult to understand. Whereas, when I look at uh, the classification rules, I see that it is very much prominent, very much applicable when my features are more or less normal. Almost all the features are nominal kind of features. Then I can very well apply the classification rules quite comfortably. So they do really well at identifying the rare events. Even if the event is occurring only for a specific combination of the features. So that is one more positive advantage. So even if the event has occurred very, very less number of times in only very few combinations, still they can very well identify the event quite comfortably. So this is one more place where generally the classification rules are generally applied. Now, the strategy which is followed by the classification rules, as I have already highlighted, is a separate and conquer strategy. So, when this is my whole data that I have, so I am looking at a rule, I am creating a rule, which covers a subset of this particular data. So, these are the subset of all the examples that are there in the training data. So, this rule is separating this data from this data. So, I have created one rule which has separated, which has created a partition between the different kinds of data, one single rule. So, after that, I keep on adding the rules. So, the more and more rules I am adding, the data is getting more bifurcated. The subsets are getting created in the data until the entire data set is covered. In case of, uh, uh, in case of uh, decision tree, it's a hierarchical structure that is getting created. Whereas here, it's not a hierarchical structure that is getting created. It's a set of logical rules which are bifurcating the data. So that is the major difference between a divide and conquer strategy versus a separate and a conquer strategy. Because in divide and conquer, so this decision is pure, is based on this decision, this decision, this decision. So the current decision, whatever I am giving here, default or not default, is based on the decisions that are occurring as a part of the past uh, nodes, as a part of the tree as such. Whereas here, there is no such kind of hierarchy. So, in case of rule learning algorithms, it's just a separation. So, it's an algorithm that is separating a set of examples. And when we are talking about the next algorithm or next rule, it is completely on a different set of features. It could be on a completely different order of the data. So, it is not based on the previous rule at all. So, that is one major difference we could see. So, there is a separation. All the rules are completely independent. There is no hierarchy that is uh, coming out as a part of each of the individual rules. Whereas, in case of decision, divide and conquer or a decision tree kind of model, such a kind of thing exists for uh, a great extent. But one commonality between both the models is both are called greedy learners. On the other side, we have seen the Nearest neighbor analysis is called as a lazy learner because there is no model that is uh, getting built at all in the nearest neighbor analysis. Whereas these two, both uh, decision trees as well as uh, classification rules are called greedy learners because the data is used on a first come first served basis. Whatever the observation that is coming in, the first data that has come in, I am using it as a part of the model. So, it is more and more efficient 
But what I have to understand is nothing is guaranteed that the best rule is going to be created for a particular data set. So they are, they are greedy learners. They try to create rules based on the first come first serve basis of the data. So initially, the way this mechanism works is all the features that are being used, it will use all the available features. Based on them, the data will be separated into homogeneous groups. And uh, after that, there is a kind of consuming larger and larger segments of the data. So initially, all the features are being used to identify the homogeneous groups. Then all the larger and larger segments of the data are typically consumed so that all the instances are typically classified. That is what goes as a part of the separate and conquer strategy. So when we uh, put it in our data, it becomes more and more comfortable for us to typically look at. Now, the way we execute them, initially, it's a very simple mechanism called one rule algorithm. Typically denoted as one R with a numeric one or a one R with one in words. So there is only one rule. So the accuracy, in some cases, what happens is the accuracy of the algorithm is so high, it can be more or less matching some of the most sophisticated algorithms from the real world task. So for some kind of uh, um, data, probably this algorithm is more and more suitable. So it is generating only one single rule and that too, that single rule is on one single variable. It's not even a combination of variables. So because of that, the rule will be easy to understand. It's readable quite easily. And in some cases, the performance is exorbitantly higher. Even if it does not perform well, at least it is a good benchmark for all the other sophisticated models to be compared against. So more complex algorithms, even if I am using them, I can compare the performance of those more complex algorithms against the results that are coming out through this particular model so, so that uh, the performance can be assessed. But on the flop side, the same thing, only one single feature, though I have provided 10 different features as input to it, it will use only one single feature to build the rule and based on that rule, the classification is happening. And because of that, sometimes it is perceived that it is very, very simplistic in nature. So what typically happens, you look at this, each feature that we are giving, right, let's say this is my data. So uh, feature one, it divides the data into groups. So feature one has, let's say three variables, A, B, C. So this is A, this is B, this is C. Now with respect to A, it will see what are the predicted classes. So there are uh, three defaults and one no default. So for this A as a class, it will give a prediction as D. Whereas here, let's say N is 10, D is 2 in this B class. So it will give the, for uh, B class, it gives that uh, the decision as N. And similarly here also, if N is 5, D is 3, even for this group, it gives the decision as N. So that is what uh, it directly does. So the one R, it is dividing the data into groups based on the similar values of the feature. So the feature is A, B, C. Based on the similar values of the feature, the data is divided into groups. So for each segment, for this group, what is the majority class? D. For this group, the majority class is N. For this group, the majority class is N. So it is uh, predicting the majority class and the error rate for the rules based on each feature is calculated. What is the error rate here? 1 out of 4 are errors. Here it is 2 out of 10, 12 and here it is 3 out of 8. So these are the error rates associated uh, with this particular feature. So overall 1 plus 2, 3 plus 3, 6 out of 8 plus 12, 24. So the error rate is around 25%. So it will look at, okay, if I'm doing the 
uh, if I am taking this as the feature the, and uh, taking the decision, then the error rate is 25%. And the rule which is having the least number of errors, the total errors are much, much lesser. That is the one rule that is typically chosen. That's the typical mechanism that is going into the one hour algorithm. So for some kind of task, it looks very, very basic. But for some kind of task, we can see that it is creating some kind of wonders as such for the, uh, uh, because of the simplification that it is bringing out. But uh, what we see now is an improvisation of the one hour algorithm called as Ripper. Ripper is nothing but repeated incremental pruning to produce error reduction. That is what we call as Ripper. So we are creating an algorithm which is a repeated incremental pruning to produce error re reduction. Because there is a general, uh, general perception or probably in general when we talked about the rule learning algorithms, the initial versions of the rule learning algorithms, they were very slow in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, abstraction. They used to learn at a much, much slower pace. And because of that, they are very ineffective when my data size is too large. If I am dealing with big data, because the learning is at a, happening at a much, much slower pace, it is very difficult to learn from the data which is pretty large. So that's where the general rule based learning algorithms were not that heavily used when the data is much larger. And they also had problems if the data is pretty much noisy. If there are so much of random variations present in the data, there is a lot of inaccuracy that was associated with the rule learning algorithms. So people started working, improvising the rule learning algorithms. That is where one of the initial versions that came out as an improvisation of the initial rule learning uh, algorithms was called as incremental reduced error pruning algorithm, IREP. So it has used some kind of pre-pruning and post-pruning method, which we talked about in case of decision trees. So it has used the combination of pre-pruning means setting up how what is the number of uh, levels that should be included in the model at the beginning itself, or grow a full-blown tree and after that start the pruning process. So the rules initially, just like the trees, I grow very very complex rules. And after that, start pruning the rules before the instances are separated from the data set. So initially, all complex rules are created. And after that, depending on how much improvisation that rule is uh, uh, creating to the information gain, even the method that is being used is similar to the method that is being used in case of decision trees, information gain which is nothing but the difference in the entropy values before the split versus after the split. So before the rule is applied versus the after the rule is applied, I am finding the difference in the entropies, calling it as information gain. And based on that particular set of rules, I am starting to prune the rules so that if there is not too much of information gain or information loss that is occurring by removing this, then I am uh, then I am removing the rule straight away. So that's the typical process uh, that was followed as a part of IREP. But still, it was uh, far away in terms of performance when I had compared it with the decision trees there. That is where the ripper came into picture. Repeated incremental pruning. So it's a repeated process. So the pruning is done on an incremental basis. Overall error reduction is occurring. So there are a set of rules that we are creating. The objective is it should at least match, if not exceed, the performance of the decision trees. All else remaining the same, it should at least match, if not exceed, the performance of the decision trees. 
So looking at some of the strengths of this algorithm, one, because it's a rule based, it's easy to understand. Compared to the initial, uh, initial rule based learning algorithms, this is more efficient even if I have to handle large data sets and even if there is a lot of uh, noise as a part of the data sets, still it can handle the stuff quite comfortably. And when I compare it with respect to a decision tree, the model, the rule typically produces a very simple model compared to all else remaining the same for a comparable decision tree. So that's one more place where it goes on a positive note. But just only looking at the positives will not help because there is no one single algorithm which will, which is a panacea for almost all the problems. Every algorithm that is designed has some strengths, some weaknesses. So the, the rules that are getting created through this, sometimes the experts may not agree at all. Experts may simply thrash those rules. That is one of the biggest things that is coming up. So they defy the common sense in many a cases. And if the data is too much of numeric, if all my features are numeric variables, then probably I should not look at using the ripper algorithm at all. And if the model is becoming very, very complex with too many features coming up, then also it is not advised to use this kind of a model. So that is how the ripper has some kind of advantages and disadvantages. Then when I look at the important stages as a part of the rules algorithm, we talk about three phases. One is the growing phase where I am growing a set of rules. So we are using the separate and conquer technique. Add as many conditions as possible to the rules. If age is greater than 50 and uh, right and uh, uh, probably the loan amount is less than or, or greater than uh, 2000 and so we are adding as many conditions to the rule until there is a perfect classification of the subset until I am able to match the subset to a particular group and this this kind of classification this kind of splitting adding the rules is again done based on the information gain criteria itself information gain is nothing but the change in the uh, entropy we have already uh, defined the entropy earlier so if I am uh, bringing in uh, a set of classes for each class I am looking at minus pi times log pi to the base 2 probability of belonging to that particular group multiplied by the logarithm of the probability belonging to that particular group we are adding across all the groups. So that is what we are calling as an entropy and uh, before the split versus after the split I am actually computing the entropy. And in whichever case the entropy has reduced quite drastically, I would be preferring that particular rule. So when there is no drop in the entropy means there is no information gain that has occurred by bringing in an additional criteria into the rule, then that rule will not be applied at all. So when increasing a rule to specificity, specificity is one more additional attribute I am bringing to the rule. It does not reduce the entropy. It does not produce an information gain. I am directly pruning that rule off. So I am looking to whatever extent there is an information gain that is coming up. There is a reduction in the entropy that is coming up. So to whatever extent there is a reduction in the entropy, I will be uh, using uh, the additional uh, uh, conditions as a part of the rule. But wherever there is no reduction in the entropy that is happening, we are pruning the process. So this process, step one, growing, pruning, growing, pruning, keeps happening until the stopping criteria is reached. What is the stopping criteria? It could be like all the subset, the whole subset is a homogeneous subset. Right? Apply, after applying the rules, whatever the subset that is getting formed, so it belongs to one single class only. 
then I don't need to do anything more on that subset. So my uh, my cri stopping criteria is reached. Or all the features are typically used for classification already and there are no more features to classify the data. Then also it's a stopping algorithm. Or I may said at the max, okay, five rules are sufficient. Then also it's a kind of a stopping criteria. So once the stopping criteria is reached, we are looking at the whole set of rules are being optimized. And uh, whereas in case of one hour algorithm, we have seen that there is only one rule that is getting created. So means there is only one antecedent. Whereas in case of ripper algorithms, the antecedents could be many more in number. So because of that reason, the complex data can be analyzed quite comfortably. But of course, as the, day, as the algorithm is becoming more and more complex, the understanding capacity, the comprehending capacity becomes much, much weaker. So that is one more drawback, but that's fine. As long as the classification is coming out more and more uh, appropriate, sometimes we may want to go ahead with that kind of a trade-off. In some cases, this, so these are the rippers. The ripper is a kind of an algorithm that is a separate algorithm altogether. But in some cases, I can have rules from the decision trees itself. So anyhow, if you see here, this is a decision tree. So this is a decision tree for me. So this, if I say this is the leaf node. So at this leaf node, there is some level of a decision that we are making. Default or no default. So I will start with the leaf node. I follow the branch back to the root. So these are all like rules. Okay, this could be age greater than 50. This is loan amount less than 2000. So these are a set of criteria itself. So this is a series of decisions. If you talk about uh, this, this is a series of decisions. All this series of decisions, I can combine them into a single rule. So that's how I can generate the rules from decision trees. So when I'm using my decision trees, uh, actually in my C5.0 algorithm, I actually have one parameter called rules equal to true. So when I said that, the whole algorithm uh, executes and uh, it will also generate the set of rules for me, which are nothing but, which is across the, uh, uh, from right from the leaf node till the root node across all the branches. But we need to understand the rules that are getting generated here are very, very complex compared to a rule learning algorithm. And there are a lot of biases because it's a kind of interdependency across all these things that are getting created. But in some cases, because it is computationally more easier, I may want to generate the rules from the decision trees also in some of the aspects. So that's how we can uh, very well uh, go ahead using uh, uh, the rules, creating the rules from the decision trees. Or in some cases, we can use the rules directly from one R kind of an algorithm or a ripper kind of an algorithm. So once this basic understanding is uh, done, I think we can take up an example data set and based on that we can uh, try executing our different kinds of uh, rule based learning algorithms to try to extract some kind of rules from the data. And so that we can do the testing and all that uh, process remains one and the same. Alright. So let's take an example data set. So the first step just like any other uh, process it's a data collection. So I have uh, taken this uh, data file called mushrooms. So I have uh, stored it in this location and I am loading it from there, calling it as rules. So let me uh, look at the dimension of the rules, which is telling me that there are 8,124 rows and 23 columns as a part of the data. Here, my objective is to identify which mushrooms are poisonous and which of them are edible. So that's the major objective. Right, I have to classify the mushrooms based on the 22 characteristics 
based on the 22 features that are associated with the mushrooms. I have to typically classify them into poisonous versus edible. That is what we are trying to bring out here. Out of the 23 columns, one is my class which talks about poisonous versus edible. The remaining 22 are features which are which are deciding to which group, the, which would be used for creating uh, uh, the rules which will decide whether a particular mushroom belongs to a poisonous group or it will become, belong to an edible group. Right? So, that's the thing. So, let's look at uh, the structure. The structure of the rules say, okay, type is a factor with two levels, edible versus poisonous. So, now if you look at uh, some of these things, these are the features of the mushroom. The cap shape, there are six different types of uh, cap shapes, bell, conical, etc. It's a factor with six variables. Cap surface, so there are four levels, fibrous, grooves, etc. Cap color, there are ten different colors that are existing, brown, buff, etc. Then we are talking about uh, bruises, there are two levels, no S. Order is having nine different kinds of orders, almond, anise, etc. Then we are talking about gill attachment, two levels, attach free, gill spacing, two levels, gill size, two levels. Let's assume that these are all different characteristics that are associated with the mushroom. Stark shape, stark root, stark surface above the ring, stark surface below the rings, stark color above the rings, below the rings. Wheel type, wheel type is coming out as factor with one level. So, there is no meaning. Why do I really need to include a wheel type with one level? There is nothing called classification out here. So, there is nothing associated to one level. Better I can remove this variable as well. Now, this is, uh, if I have to remove the variable, I can very well uh, delete the stuff, right? So, I will simply say rules is a subset of the rules again, wherein I am taking all the rows. Columns wise, I will not consider 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17th column. So, that is where I will set it as minus 17. So, these are the rules. So, I am taking these rules. Let me take the structure of the rules once again. So, now all of them will have at least two factors altogether. All of them are factors. So, there is, a, so there is, because everything is a numeric data, I can very well uh, apply this uh, algorithm quite comfortably. Because if there is a numeric data, I would be having some kind of problems. So, because everything is uh, a factors, structural kind of a data, I do not need to have too much of a problem with the process. Then, I am also looking at the distribution of the class variable. So, I can directly find out the table associated with rules dollar type. So, I will see how many mushrooms are poisonous and how many of them are edible. So, it gives me that there are uh, almost uh, in my data, there are 3916 poisonous mushrooms and 4208 edible ones. So, approximately more or less uh, equal, but otherwise to be more precise, I could see that approximately 48% uh, of them are poisonous and 52% of them are edible. So, now our objective is to really see can I identify what factors, what variables will differentiate a poisonous mushroom from an edible mushroom. So, that is where we want to look at uh, the 22 features which are going to determine that. First of all, the reason why we have looked at uh, the distribution of the class variable is if it is more and more imbalanced, of course, in this case, it is not. 48, 52 is the proportion. If it is more and more or less imbalanced, 
the rule learning algorithms will have a lot of difficulty especially if my objective is to predict the minority class so if it if that if the percentages are 10 and 90 or 5 and 95 kind of stuff the rule learning algorithms will have some kind of problems in terms of predicting the minority class though they can do a good job with the majority class okay now we'll uh, do the step 3 which is the training the model so the training the model means i have to actually split my data into a training data versus a testing data so initially i will do a set seed thousand i'll take the train as a variable i'm not explaining this process i have already explained this process in my other videos so the train i'll be uh, uh, creating approximately 70 percent of the data so what is the 70 percent of 8124 i'll take the 70 percent of 8124 8124 into 0.7 so almost 5687 Right, so let me uh, take it as 5687 as the 70% of the data. So let me uh, create a train where I am looking at uh, a sample from 1 to 8124. Out of this 1 to 8124, I am taking a sample of 5687 elements. 5687 elements randomly where the replace is false means I am not duplicating the values at all. So this is what is making my data as a train. This is what are randomly I am selecting 5687 numbers from 1 to 8124 without any repetition. So the remaining numbers are typically treated as a part of my testing rows whereas these rows that are coming as a part of the train are treated as a part of my training rows so i'll call it as training data training data is nothing but it's a subset of rules where i am taking the rows as train and all the columns similarly i am looking at testing data testing data is also a subset of rules where I am considering minus train rows and all the columns from it. So my data is being split into training data and the testing data quite comfortably. So now we will use the rules. So the zero R benchmark, zero rules benchmark. What is the zero rules benchmark? The maximum data, which is 52%. Right? The maximum class, the majority class is 52%. So the minimum accuracy that I can expect, even if there are no rules that are coming out, even if there is no rule that I am building to classify a poisonous versus a non-poisonous mushroom, even if I consider that all mushrooms are edible, the error rate is 48%. The accuracy will be 52%. So this is where any rule that I am creating, it should be much, much better than the 52%. So I need, again, as an objective, my rules should be as simple as possible so that they are easy to remember. So as a part of our first step, we will apply the one hour classifier. One rule algorithm is what we are going to apply. And after that, to see if I can improve something on it, I would be applying the ripper algorithm. So initially, I would apply the one hour algorithm. So, out of the 21 features that we are having, it has to select on one single feature that is most predictive of the target class. So, which can really classify which mushrooms are poisonous and which mushrooms are edible. So, one single feature, one single rule, which will typically classify which of them are poisonous and which of them are edible. And that feature is used to construct a set of rules. So let's try to go ahead doing that kind of an implementation. Right? That would be there as a part of our Weka package. So let's try to implement this our Weka package and then we'll use the one hour algorithm on the top of that particular package. Right? 
will install the Arveka package. Let me see if it is already installed on my system. Otherwise, you have to install your Arveka package. So this package is not there on my system, so I am installing this package, which is also uh, installing our Weka jars. Now that the R Veka jar is uh, in, uh, already installed, now it is trying to install the R Veka. So once it installs the R Veka, we can load it and we can use the 1R package from that R Veka. All right, so it's almost uh, on the verge of installation. Right, so all the packages have been installed. So I will load my library, Arbeka. So it requires actually the Java also to be installed on the machine. So if Java is not there, then the Arveka cannot get loaded. So probably that could be the reason why the Arveka is not getting installed onto my system. Let me see if that is the reason. I may have to install Java on the system. It is getting a uh, stop, so which means I need to install Java on my system. So we are installing Java on the system. Okay, you have successfully installed Java on your system. Alright, so the Java is uh, installed on the system. Let me uh, just close this. Now, now that Java is already installed on the system, let me uh, restart the R. Now let me load the library R Veka. Okay, now this R Veka got installed, which means the Java needs to be installed on your system if we have to use the R Veka. But of course, right now, because of this reason, our uh, data got lost altogether. So better let me uh, load the data, of course the previously saved workspace is loaded. So let me uh, try quickly uh, searching out for the name of the variable that we have given. 
rules is the name of the variable that we have given, right? So we will uh, look at the dim of rules. No, rules object is not there. So which means our workspace object was typically not saved. So let me load the rules again. So quickly I am uh, loading the rules again. Now uh, out of this rules we have removed the column number 17. So we have made uh, rules as again a subset of rules comma minus 17 because that was containing only one variable. Then we have uh, split this rules into a training data versus a testing data. So we have set the seed of 1000. Train is being set as sample 1 to 8124. Probably let's uh, quickly uh, make it 5900 is the size of the sample and uh, replace equal to false. So approximately 70% is the training data. So based on that, I'll call as train data which is nothing but out of the rules, I am taking a subset where train is the values, uh, the rows to be included and all the columns. Then I have another variable called test data where I am uh, taking a subset of the rules whereas I am taking a minus train as the input means those things that are not there as a part of the train, those rows will be included as a part of the testing data. So let me go up to here. And now once I have broken the data into training and testing, I need to see whether the one rule is doing much better than the benchmark. So we have discussed that part. So now I have to implement the one hour package. So uh, I will uh, do it on the training data. So I'll use the package, uh, I'll use the function called one hour. So let me uh, save this one hour as a part of the model. So 1R is the name of the function. I have to give this 1R as the class. What is the class variable here? I have to uh, specify my class variable out here. The type. The type is what I am giving as the class variable. And till day, I have to give the predictors. If I say I wanted to go ahead with all the predictors that are available, all the remaining things are predictors, we'll put a simple dot. Dot itself means consider all else except the type as the predictors for it. This is a typical notation we'll see as a formula notation in many a places. So I can say I want to create, uh, I want to look at type versus the rest of all the variables. So you create a rule based on any one of them. And the data that I am giving here is the training data, which is the train data. So I am giving the train data to this uh, algorithm. So the class is the type, the type which is poisonous or edible. And the formula that I am putting at the list of predictors is all the predictors. But if I have only one or two predictors, then I can, uh, let's say, put order plus color plus whatever. So if I have only a few set of variables, then I can put them like this. But if I want all the 21 variables, then I can put a direct dot. So my classifier is getting built this way. This is the way my model got built. Now I can very well use the model to typically do the prediction. But before I do the prediction, I want to verify the goodness of my model, right? So that's where I can very well say model. I can type in model. When I'm typing in the model name, it will give me the rules that it has created. So it says it has created the rule based on the order. And the rule is if the order is almond, it is edible. If the, uh, if the uh, order is anise, it is also edible. But if the order is creosote or fishy or foul or musty, then it is poisonous. If there is no order at all, still it is edible. And if it is pungent, poisonous, spicy, poisonous. So overall I could see 
it was able to classify 5810 out of 5900 approximately 98 and a half percent of them are classified as correct through this particular uh, rule so the one single rule is created based on the order and that one single rule it is able to achieve the 98.5 percent accuracy now i can very well uh, use this for the prediction purpose on my testing data as well so that i can uh, look at the accuracy on the testing as well so i'll use my variable as spread which i am talking of as predict the name of the model is the model itself and my test data is test data so based on that it has predicted and now so the pred has actually given me an input as some of them are edible some of them are poisonous so the better thing is do a comparison make a table so the table is it will have predicted on one side the actual is containing from the test data i am taking the dollar type so the type is from the test data so we are looking at the predicted where it has given 1156 edible ones are correctly classified 1030 poisonous ones are correctly classified only the error is with respect to this 30 and here it is zero something has been predicted as poisonous but they are actually edible not a big problem it's like the foresight it has predicted that this particular mushroom could be poisonous but in reality it turned out to be a, an edible one but there are 30 things which are very very dangerous right it has predicted that this particular uh, 30 are actually edible but they turned out to be poisonous which is a very very serious problem we should be uh, able to address this problem reduce the problem because people might have consumed this uh, uh, mushroom and they became more and more poisonous so this rule Though it has uh, done a 95, 98% kind of an accuracy, but still we see that there is some kind of a limitation that is associated because 30 of them got wrongly classified. So the process here is I can evaluate the performance of the model. So one way of evaluating the performance is through this, whereas the other way is I can very well take the summary of the model. So when you look at the summary. so from the training data it gives me this information approximately 98.47% are correctly classified 1.52% are wrongly classified right now don't uh, focus on these statistics because i have a separate uh, session where i will look at all the different models of evaluating the performance so there i would be covering what is a kappa statistic what is root mean squared error etc but here what we should look at is the confusion matrix itself now here at least the good thing is this number is zero what it means is my system has classified it as poisonous right whereas actually it is edible it has been classified as poisonous but it came out to be edible so this this is uh, completely zero whereas here the number is 90 whereas here the number came out to be 90 so this is what is the problem that is associated with this uh, particular matrix so the ones that are edible they are getting classified as poisonous now this is how i am looking at the evaluation of the performance of the particular model now i want to improvise on the performance of the model so instead of relying on one hour algorithm i am looking at a ripper algorithm so the ripper algorithm is again in the same package r weka only but instead of using one hour kind of a, a method i am using a method called jrip it's also a java based implementation everything is the same so i'll say model 1 wherein i am taking jrip the class is type dollar uh, tilde all the predictors i'll take so i am taking dot 
and uh, the data that I am taking is the train data. All else remaining the same. The whole model is similar to that of uh, to that of uh, the one hour algorithm. That's one advantage with this. So the second model is getting built out here. So let's see what is this model all about. Model one, if I am typing. So these are the rules that got created. Order equal to foul. So the moment I am getting a foul order, I am very well saying it's a poisonous mushroom. So zero wrong classification. All 15, 79 observations are there, which are uh, foul ordered ones. And all of them are uh, poisonous only. Similarly, if the gill size is narrow and gill color is buff, then also it came out that they are poisonous mushrooms. And 843 such kind of uh, mushrooms are there and all of them turned out to be poisonous. Similarly, gill size is narrow and order is pungent. Again, there are 183 such kind of mushrooms. All of them are correct. No misclassification at all. Similarly, you go ahead. Order is creosote. Still, they are poisonous. Spore print color is green. Then also they are poisonous. Stark surface below the ring is scaly. Stark surface above the ring is silky. Then also they are poisonous. Stark color above the ring is yellow. Then also they are poisonous. So it is able to classify the data in such a way and overall give me that all these are poisonous. Rest all are edible. So you could see that there is no misclassification when we are using it on the training data. Now what I want to do is, I want to create a prediction onto the testing data to see if the, if the misclassification is anywhere bigger or smaller. So this is where I can use the predict model 1 and I can use it on the test data. I am doing it on the test data, the predict. So now I can very well create a table wherein I am taking the PRED1 which is the model that has predicted and the actuals I am taking it from test data dollar type. So when I look at this, wow, the classification is excellent. There are zero poisonous in any of the categories. So that is the advantage of having the JRIP kind of an algorithm. You could clearly see that there is no error at all of course, this is one such kind of a scenario which is much, much more effective kind. So, the syntax is very much consistent across the algorithm. So, the comparison is much, much better. I have looked at uh, what are the rules that came out and the numbers that are indicating is number of instances covered and how many misclassifications are there. The moment I have looked at the table, I could see that this is zero, this is zero. So, which means the misclassification is zero. So, I have a model to very consistently identify which, which mushrooms could be poisonous and which mushrooms could be very much edible. Of course, don't get carried away with the 100% accuracy out here. This could be one such kind of an instance where such kind of identification is more easier. But in real world, it's not that uh, easier for us to arrive at this kind of a classification mechanism. So this is what I wanted to uh, look at as a part of this uh, session. We covered uh, the separate and conquer strategy. We looked at one rule algorithm, the ripper algorithm. We have installed the RWCA package and we have brought out the implementation of both one rule algorithm as well as the ripper algorithm. And if I have to uh, extract the decision rules from tree, decision trees, what is the mechanism that we need to follow? Even that we have basically understood. I hope uh, your understanding regarding the classification rules is uh, uh, more comfortable right now. If you have any further queries, you can very well get in touch with me by giving me a call on the number that I have provided below. Or you can send in an email at momcesar at the rate of Thanks a lot for listening to this uh, session. Thank you very much.